Good afternoon. So as I mentioned during the announcements, in two weeks from today, we will be celebrating the uh, Feast of Trumpets, and then um, two weeks after that, um, the uh, Feast of Tabernacles will uh, commence. And as we have said so many times in the past, and it's still true today, that the feast should be a foretaste of the kingdom to come. So I thought what I'd do today is um, give us a little bit of a foretaste, and the, the sermon, therefore, is entitled, Celebrating the Feast, or sorry, get my title wrong, uh, Celebrating the Kingdom Yet to Come. Leading up to that, I, uh, how many of you were out this week and uh, saw, um, a, saw the moon on Thursday night? Uh, I happened to be at a campground, and, and of course, the, the skies were clear, and there was a lot of chatter about the fact that it was not just the blue moon. I mean, you've, you've heard this saying, it's once in a blue moon. And I mean, I know what the, what the idiom or the metaphor means, but I thought, well, actually, what is actually a blue moon? Uh, how many, does anybody know what a blue moon, what the definition of a blue moon is? Uh, Susan does, but that's not fair. Um, Kathy? Yeah, well, I was a little bit disappointed when I when I, I I I read that because it's entirely coincidental, because it's just the the happenstance of having two full moons within a Roman month, uh, which really has uh, no meaning. But it obviously doesn't occur that very often because as the full moon cycles through the thirty or thirty-one day months of the Roman calendar, it only occurs on occasion. But then there was another aspect that we had this year, and that is the number of supermoons, and that is a lunar event. So we've had, or will have, three supermoons in a row. Um, and uh, we had this one, well, we had one at the beginning of August, and then the one that we just had this week at the end of August, and then the, the moon um, that the Feast of Tabernacles commences with this year will also be a supermoon. And the supermoon, I, I do have some statistics on that. The, the supermoon is, or I should say, appears 14% larger than a average moon or the smallest moon. And the reason it, it, the moon didn't actually grow, right? I mean, it didn't gain weight or do anything of that sort. It's just that it is closer to the Earth, therefore appears bigger. And the other thing is, it appears to be 30% brighter. Um, and you know, this is mo most noticeable at moon rise or moon set. So um, I'm looking forward to that at the Feast of Tabernacles because, you know, on Passover and, or the first day of unleavened bread, um, the first day of unleavened bread always coincides with the full moon, as does the uh, first day of the Feast of Tabernacles. So... Um, you know, anciently that facilitated travel when you think about it. You know, the weather's generally nicer around a, moon, a full moon, and of course you can you could see the travel, so there was um, a purpose to that. But um, I the there's I know that in our family, you know, the moon that the full moon that we just had kind of builds anticipation, uh, which is a word that I'm I'm going to use in my sermon today. Um, when we have this, this full moon, you go out there and you say, well, you know, one more month. One more month and we're, we're going to be going to the feast. So I, I wanted to mention that as an introduction. I also have um, this handout that I thought I would share with you because this is one of the years that the, there is a calibration of the calendar. So... Um, you know, otherwise, or unfortunately known as postponement, actually the, the Hebrew word that is used in the Hebrew calendar that is translated postponement actually is and can be translated calibration because that's actually what it is. So for example, the full moon, um, if you look at this sheet, um, <clears throat> the the full moon that is that starts the feast this year on on a Friday at moonrise is ninety nine percent 
full at moonrise on the Friday evening. If you back it up a day, um, and, and if, we, if you wouldn't postpone it to, I should say calibrate, <laughs> um, move it to the next day, it would only be 97 point, I think it was 97.4% full. On this list, I, I did this work uh, for the calendar paper and the council earlier this spring. You can see the, um, um, the fullness of the moon, and the 99.8 here, um, that is the average between the first day of unleavened bread and the first day of the feast. So I, uh, to me, this was this this particular thing was particularly uh, encouraging to me because you know the Hebrew calendar has been around since forever. Well, not forever, but I mean a version of it goes back um, to Christ's time, and the accuracy with which it is able to calculate the holy days. Um, is pretty impressive, and these numbers, th these just go back, this only goes back to, what did I do, 1978. It goes back through a couple of 19-year time cycles, and it always works. Um, that's, that's the beauty about math and things like that, you know, one plus one is always two, uh, contrary to, you know, what uh, some people might think. So I, I, wanted, I gave that to you just for your information. There's also a handout on the information table uh, that I drug back up here if you're interested in a little bit more detail. So I'd like to begin the, the uh, message regarding the kingdom yet to come um, in Mark chapter 1. In Mark chapter 1, we have a oft-quoted scripture that of a statement Jesus made as his ministry commenced. Mark chapter 1. This is after, in verse 13, we don't often read this. And he was there in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. This is a, a shorter summary of the 40-day fast and his subsequent temptation. And then he came to Galilee, and John was put in prison. And Jesus came to Galilee, verse 14, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. The good news that there was a kingdom to come was a central component of Jesus and the apostles' message all the way through the end of the book of Acts, if you care to document that. The gospel is an old English word that simply means good news. And th for one thing, I mean, this was, a, this was a message of good news that gained international, international acclaim because Jesus was able to articulate it in a way that people took, in, took notice and took interest in contrast to today. It's the bad news <laughs> that gets attention. It is the scandal that gets attention. It is the absurd that uh, gets the attention. I was talking to Sean on the way up, and I said, you know, if you want to, if you want to get a lot of views on YouTube, you, you have to post something that is either obnoxious or absurd. I mean, that's just the way it works in it. And I think it, um, it appeals to the darker nature of our culture. But here, Jesus was the exact opposite. He preached a message of good news about the kingdom of God, and notice what he said. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So in contrast to believing in the bad news and all the bad things that are going to occur, he encouraged his people and his disciples to believe in the good news component of it. And, and there was an urgency to his message. He said, it's at hand. And he, he continued to preach that, and the, the, the disciples also had urgency to their message. And it was connected to the appeal to repent, which simply means to change, which maybe that's what, what got, got him international acclaim, and it spread throughout the known world after his death and resurrection. It's the, the appeal to change, <laughs> which is 
the opposite of what human nature wants to do. I'm, I'm rather satisfied with, you know, what I am. Isn't that part of the, the woke culture today? You know, you, I'm, I'm just so happy with who I am. I mean, I, 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 they've been telling me I'm a woman all my life. And I just discovered that I'm a man. And I'm embracing who I feel I am, you know, and, and, they, and, and we're, we're expected to accept them for who they are. Jesus did not accept people for who they were. He challenged them to become what he and his father want us to be. And that urgency will always be. And it anticipates a component of the kingdom that is yet to come. And that is what the Feast of Tabernacles celebrates in advance. So I thought today we go through that and talk about and just kind of refresh our memory about a lot of the scriptures that we no doubt will hear about at the Feast of Tabernacles because we, we rehearse this every year because there is a component of the kingdom that is urgent, that is relevant today, and we'll, hopefully we'll be able to kind of connect that in the context of what we might do at the Feast of Tabernacles that is present. And, you know, the, the, th this is a, what I would call a psychological dynamic. The future that you create is dependent upon your commitment and urgency to the present situation and how you deal with it, and that will determine the future. I mean, that doesn't take rocket, you know, if, let, let me try to make this really simple because it is really simple. You know, if you don't labor on Labor Day, okay, we'll come back to that, right? And instead you loaf. If, if loafing is part of your everyday life, it will predict a future. It will anticipate a future that is consistent with that outcome. If, on the other hand, you work on Labor Day, well, I'm going. I, I'm just digging a hole that's deeper as we go along, aren't we? Okay. If we labor and are in, intentional about what we're doing and get a good education or training, it anticipates a future. So it comes back to a, an even simpler concept. You know, you've heard the, shall I say, the trite expression, follow Jesus. There's nothing wrong with that statement. In fact, um, I think you can make an argument that that's really all you need to know. But let me explain what that means. If you take that statement literally on what it, is, what it is able to do, and you follow Jesus, here are some of the things that you will do. I mean, you're going to follow Jesus right into the waters of baptism because that is what he did to set an example. You will, you will follow Jesus and serve people in all aspects of life. You will, you will follow Jesus into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and you will stand up and read. And that's, you will follow Jesus into death and rise through a resurrection that is comparable to him, to the resurrection of, well, I shouldn't say comparable, but that will be a resurrection to glory in the same manner that he already experienced. You see what I mean? I mean, you, you just follow, but it means something. The statement is correct. But the way it is generally used is just follow Jesus and what they mean in, in, in actuality is profess Jesus, but just come as you are. There's no change. There's no action around the immediacy of this that requires repentance, which means change. The urgency to repent is ever-present, but there is a kingdom yet to come that has motivated the disciples of Christ from the beginning. You know, if you look at, if you look at the Apostle Paul, if you look at the Apostle Peter, 
uh, starting at Pentecost, and, and you, you look at their ministry, there was urgency in their message, and they had a full expectation that somehow in their lifetime, uh, Jesus would return. And, and people say, well, I mean, they got it wrong. Well, okay, um, maybe so. But if, if they had not anticipated that, and I think that was one of the reasons Jesus said, I mean, it's not for you to know. Because, you know, that would increase the tendency to just loaf and not do things. <clears throat> After his resurrection, he continued to teach them about the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And the disciples, when the disciples asked, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? I mean, they, they understood that. They understood ultimately what the kingdom yet to come was all about that it would be a restoration of a kingdom on this earth that would bring back together the 12 tribes of Israel and there would be rulership and a, and a change coming. They, I'm sure that they talked a lot about this that is not even documented in the Gospels. So when, when Jesus, when they were walking with him for the 40 days afterwards and it's documented in Acts, they had this question, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he responded that the timing to establish the kingdom was not for them to know because that remains in the Father's authority. The Father kept the when in his authority, but he reveals other things about the kingdom yet to come in great detail, and we'll look at a few today in the time we have together. So the first thing we'll look at is this. Who will be part of the kingdom yet to come? Who? So to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. <clears throat> And we'll begin reading in verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads, or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So here you have a pretty definitive statement about who is going to be part of that kingdom, and we make a distinction between being in the millennial reign as the remnant left over, and those who the next word will go to who actually inherit. There's a, there's a that, that sounds like a small difference, but it's actually a big difference that I hope to illuminate a little bit today. Verse 6, blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. And here's why it's blessed. Over such the power of this, over such the second death has no power. Wow. I mean, that's a notable and significant reason to be part of the first resurrection. And, it, and it, re it really puts eternal life in a practical, um, it makes a practical explanation. If you have eternal life, right, then the second death will have no power over you. But it's, you know, the second death is described a little bit later in this chapter. Continuing, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. This, I mean, just the passage that we read, we could probably spend the rest of the, the sermon unpacking that. I mean, it defines the day. And in this case, it's those who did not take on the sign of the beast or worship his image, 
who were martyred. I mean, these people paid a heavy price in order to be part of this first resurrection over which the second death has no power. So they'll, they'll inherit the kingdom. There are others who live through the millennial reign of Christ and the priests of God that we are called to serve. We'll look at some of that. But let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We'll, we'll go there um, a, a couple of times, but 1 Corinthians chapter 15 describes this resurrection, this first resurrection, in more definitive detail. Now, this is Paul writing, and he makes a very important point in verse 50. Now, this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood, okay, I think that's you and I, I'm looking around here, I, I see a lot of flesh and blood in the room here. I mean, it, it, you prick yourself, I mean, blood comes out. I, I learned this week the, um, the benefit of hair, you know. I would, I would have you know, Jeff, there's that toupee that you have. I don't know, it's your, your real hair has, has benefits. So I'm, um, I'm helping Daniel set up the RV and I stand up at the wrong place. You go, goom, you know, gong up here on this, you know, very, you know, um, <clears throat> bald head, okay? And I ended up with, it's probably still up there. I haven't looked in the mirror. I ended up with a gash about an inch long. I know that because when I put a Kleenex on top of it, the blood was an inch long. Right, so I mean that was a reminder. I'm I'm really flesh and blood, you know. It's that's, and Paul makes the statement here. I tell you, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Think about that for a minute. There is the, you know, you have the amillennialists and the premillennialists and all the millennialists. I mean, there's, the, there's the, the notion that the kingdom of God is already on it, that Jesus came back. I just, I mean, this, this is a YouTube video I saw just recently, um, that, that Jesus actually returned in just after 72 AD. Um, and I'm thinking, okay, I mean, it, the, 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 the YouTube video in contrast to my sermons had a lot of views <laughs> you know <laughs> we generally get maybe 150 or 300 views you you should do a better job of sharing them right and see if we can uh crank it up a little bit more you get thousands of views you know i mean it's absurd to to pur purport that jesus returned in in 70 or 72 a.d well Paul said here, flesh and blood human beings, I don't care how good you are, you can't, it says here, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. This word inherit, by the way, uh, is used throughout the New Testament and the Old Testament in the Septuagint translation, um, and it means just that, to inherit something. So the kingdom of God yet to come is something that you and I can inherit, but we can't do it in flesh and blood. Continuing, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So this is not, you know, it's not kind of in a, a progression where your flesh and blood just gets stronger and better and better. Okay, there is a transformation that takes place where flesh and corruption is transformed into incorruption. It is at that point that we inherit the kingdom, which also, I think, is a good, very good way of showing that the kingdom of God is way more than 
a 1,000-year reign. The kingdom of God is the family of God that will grow and expand, as we will see here in a moment, to include many sons and daughters to take on the image of the heavenly man. Come with me, if you will, to another book of, that Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. I mean, this is the, the eternal battle, okay? The, the Spirit is the one that puts to death the works of the flesh. Verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. You know, the, the Ephesians chapter 1 talks about the Holy Spirit being a down payment of our salvation. And, you know, here, here is a, this is a really, really critical link. It says here that if you are led by the Spirit of God, you are the sons of God. Now, we, the verb tense here is present tense. So upon baptism and receiving of the Holy Spirit, it becomes a guarantee to our salvation, but it's like an inheritance, you know. Uh, my, my father passed away a little bit over a year ago, and while he was living, I mean, I was in his will, right? But I did not receive my inheritance until after his death. I did not receive ownership, but I was still his son, right? So we are present tense as we read in 1 John chapter 3. We might go there if we have time. We are present tense sons and daughters of God, but, but only in the sense that it's something that we look, the, the inheritance we look forward to. Notice in verse 15, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. Oh, that's a big one. You know, I, nobody here is afraid, right? You've never been motivated by fear. It's, it is exactly what is predicted here. It is bondage, the spirit of fear. But you have received the spirit of adoption by whom we cried out, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs. Okay? I was an heir. I was also a son. But the inheritance occurred at a particular point in time. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if, de if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So what Paul is saying here is exactly what he also says in 1 Corinthians. We will, we will turn there in a minute. But remember when Jesus was on his knees in Gethsemane, he he, he told the Father, glorify me with the glory that I had with you before the world began. Referring back to what we read in, in John chapter 1 when the word was with God prior to becoming flesh. So what we read here is that if we suffer today, and we all do, I mean pain and suffering and uh, affliction is just simply a part of life and there's plenty of it go around. We would all agree with that. Oh, I did, I, I, I um, forgot to mention one thing. Scott, I hope you don't mind. He said, I'm not a trendsetter. Like, I didn't know that. I didn't. <laughs> if there's one thing in my life that I haven't been able to do is to set, to set trends. Okay, I, I look back, and there are usually not very many people behind me. But anyway, the good news is Scott does not have Lyme disease. I did want to share that with you. So that that's, that's really good. Okay, now where was I at? Um, so what, we, what, we, what, what Jesus said in, in Gethsemane is consistent with what Paul here says. And, and what, when you think about it, we are to be glorified together with Christ. That's significant because glorification according to Jesus is that same glory that he had with the Father before the world came, before the world was. 
Now let's go to back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And notice how Paul um, builds this out. <clears throat> So we read in verse 50 about the fact that flesh and blood cannot inherit. And it is Paul's very consistent. He called us heirs, which is different from inheriting. I mean, it being you can be an heir before uh, you inherit. Notice in verse 42, so also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. We all die. But it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And I, you know, how many of you know what I'm going to say next here? It's going to sound like a broken record. But I'm, I'm going to say it again. The statement here by Paul that there is a spiritual body, make note of that. Because at some point in time, you're going to need it. Because somebody is going to try to make God into some vague, um, uh, what's the word? Mind, mindless, bodiless spirit that uh, you can't you know, have a relationship with. And Paul makes a point here that there is a spiritual body. It is written... The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Now, think about that. Think about it in the context of this kingdom yet to come and who's going to be in it and the glorification that takes place prior to that. And if you, t if, if you take it to its logical conclusion, if you, if you just let these words speak, if we are to bear the image of the heavenly man, we are to, at that point, be, be life-giving spirits. Okay? And you, you can take that at, at, at a number of levels, and there is, a, there is a component today. You can give life today to your fellow man, and it may be as simple as just handing some food to them. I mean, that's pretty life-giving for some people, and if you look at the statistics today on, you know, what the, the number of people that live in poverty, it's well over half now in the United States. I mean, that's just, I mean, a dollar is not worth a dollar. So, again, as I've said so many times, and, and I, I reemphasize this, God's way works. There's one thing that I'm convicted of more than, it just works. And it doesn't matter now or in the future. Life-giving spirit Continuing, the spiritual is not first, but the natural. Afterward, the spirit, if we can't at some fractional level be a life-giving person, I think it is safe to say that God will not give us the capacity to do it in a more powerful way. A selfish, he's already had experience with a selfish spirit being um, his name was Lucifer, and now his name is Satan. And, and you see the destructive results. The first man was of the earth made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. Verse 49. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we also shall bear the image of the heavenly man. This is consistent with what Paul said in Romans. This is consistent with what Jesus said in the Garden of Gethsemane. It is consistent with what John says in 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. So it's about, I mean, we, we look at who will be part of this kingdom yet to come. I mean, it, it's, this is big stuff. This is about transforming an entire world one individual at a time. And to do so as a group of 
um, reigning individuals that are looking at it in an entirely different way than, than structure and uh, hierarchy works today. Uh, hierarchy, for the most part, um, works just about as effectively as the pyramids of Egypt. Uh, those, those hierarchical structures uh, that the pyramid, pyramids portrayed. Romans, let's go back to Romans chapter 8. This has, shall we say, cosmic implications. Cosmic implications. <clears throat> Verse 17, we read, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, joined heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Verse 18, for I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. You know, Paul knew suffering. For the earnest expectation of the creation, here's the cosmic component of it, the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Wow. That doesn't sound like it's limited to the earth, does it? Or to a millennial experiment. Continuing, verse 22, For we know the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now, and not only they, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. And, you know, I, I, I've had my um, kind of wake-up call this summer. You know, I would go around choking that, yeah, you know, I wake up every morning and nothing hurts and everything works until it didn't. <laughs> so, um, yeah, this, this old piece of hunk of flesh and blood still works pretty well. I mean, it, it works pretty well, but I, I'd trade it in on this one any day. I'd trade it in. First John chapter 3. Verse 1, Behold what manner of agape the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when, we, when he is revealed at his coming, at that great trumpet sound, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And Jesus, or Paul wrote, that we would be glorified together with him. To be like him. And, you know, if you read the commentaries on this, that's exactly what the, the, the Greek language means. So, um, that's great. But I would like to call our attention to the very next verse, because it, goes, it tracks back to what we read in that opening statement when Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and he said, repent. So there's a call to repentance here because it says, and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. That's now. That's urgent. That's our work today. So the question, who will be part of the kingdom yet to come? 
these people, us, those who have the, the Holy Spirit, who have had the Holy Spirit down through time. But it is not an inheritance that doesn't come without responsibility. Let's take a look at the, the second point. And I just, I just picked these out. These are all points that I am confident we'll hear a lot more about during the Feast of Tabernacles. So this is a foretaste. The second, second one is, what will this kingdom be like? Now we, you know, there's a lamb and there's a lion and the desert blossoming as a rose. We'll read all of that. But let's read, let's just take the time and read Isaiah chapter 11. But I'm going to start, I'm going to start at the beginning of Isaiah chapter 11. Because for the kingdom, for the kingdom to be like, you know, to be so all-encompassing that it even transforms the nature of animals, um, you know, that just doesn't happen because it happens. There's a reason for it, and we read it here in the in the ver starting in verse one. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. I mean, this is widely, I mean, I think it's safe to say, universally recognized as a messianic promise, or I should say a messianic prophecy. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And his delight, I mean, this is, you know, you, 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 you look at this, and this, this individual of which it is prophesying not only has the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, he delights in the fear of the Lord. So this is, a, this is an attitudinal component, and it, and it is prophesying about Jesus Christ. Now, I, I just want to play this out a little bit, and, and let's think about this a little bit, based on what we, have, we just read about co-heirs with Christ. And what, imagine, you know, what, what would the world be like? I mean, what would, what would politics look like today if the Spirit of the Lord would rest upon him, if the Spirit of wisdom and understanding would be present, and the Spirit of the knowledge and the fear of the Lord would be present would that be transformative? I mean, would that be would that be different from what we see today? Where, um, I mean, I think it is safe to say that governments around the world, generally speaking, maybe literally speaking, are corrupt from top to bottom. And when they purport to, um, I don't know what's happening here. Is that the system? Doesn't seem to be me. Um, okay, something is sensitive. Um, even when they purport to help, I got a lot of calls this week, and most of them weren't, um, shall we say, of the sort that is congratulations. It's like my, I'm, I'm on my way to Michigan, and the caller ID pops up, Tuscarawas County Health Department. And I thought, hmm, what, what could they possibly want? Okay, so I pick up the phone and say, hello. And they ask me, is this John Miller? I said, yeah, John Miller. And they said, um, we heard you have Lyme disease. And I said, hmm. I said, yes, that's true. I'm just interested in how you know that and why you would need to know. And she goes, well, um, Lyme is a reportable disease. I didn't know that. I, I, I guess it is. And as it turns out, my doctor <laughs> reported it probably uh, required by law to do so. So 
she was very friendly, and she went down to this. I mean, what are your symptoms? And I said, well, you know, and then we, we talked for a couple minutes, and and, um, and and she was happy with what she was happy that I was better. But here was the closing statement that just sent shock waves through my entire being. She said, well, it seems like you're doing well and you're under good care, but I just want you to know that if you need anything, we're here to help. And I thought, I'm not sure I want a government agency looking out for me. And, I'll, and I will tell you why, okay? This is the same Department of Health in the first two weeks of COVID when we had our first case. I mean, this is where, I mean, you didn't know whether it was the Black Death. One of our managers tested positive, or his wife tested positive, excuse me. So we're like, I mean, we're 10, 11 o'clock at night. You know, what do we do? You know, do we have to shut the whole place down? You know, so, so we called for help. Same department. Nobody, couldn't get a hold of anybody. So then I called the head of our local EMT, who is a doctor, who I knew, knew the health commissioner, and he tried to call. No response. Days went by, no response. So, you know, we, we, we did what we needed to do and, and everything worked out. And I thought, okay, fine. You know, it's a crisis. She has a lot to do, you know, no, no big deal. But here's, where I, here's where, where I learned something different. It was about four weeks later when, when our local health department was funded by the federal government to help with COVID, and they were able to hire some people to help. And the help came in, in the form of creating all kinds of restrictions that put businesses out of business. So anyway, that was my little rant, okay? And, it is, it, and here's why it's relevant. That is the thinking. That is how bureaucracies, however well-intentioned today, when it gets down to the, uh, the application of it, it invariably becomes bondage. And it becomes bondage because they do not embrace, <laughs> for the most part, what is, what, what is prophesied here in Isaiah chapter 11. Continuing, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide the, for the equity of the meek of the earth. Okay, if you'll, if you'll oblige me, this was an eventful week, so maybe, maybe, maybe this is the benefit. You know, the, here it says that he will judge the poor with righteousness. Why do you think that's in there? Is that a problem today that the, the poor get a different judgment from those who have means? So I got another call this week. <laughs> I managed to burn down a piece of equipment that a uh, straw blower, I don't know if I told you about this, I, I, I managed to turn a straw blower into a bonfire and burn down a trailer. Okay. So I felt really bad because it was a local, I took the thing back, I power washed the remains of it and took it back. Um, and, then, and then the question is, okay, so I said, you know, I'm good for it. <laughs> I'll make sure this thing gets, so I turned it into my insurance. Okay? Now, I bought a farm. I got an endorsement to my policy for farm insurance. Okay? I called my agent, which is not going to be my agent much longer. I'll know that. The same agent that sold me this endorsement now proceeded for 10 minutes to tell me why this probably isn't covered by the insurance that he sold me. And, and he said, I'll turn it in. Okay. So on my trip to Michigan, I, I get a call from the agent. No, actually, I called him to get an update. I said, how are we doing on this claim? Oh, they didn't call you? I said, no, they didn't call me. Oh, the agent said he was going to call you and let you know that you don't have coverage. 
I don't know why he would hesitate to call me with that message. The last conversation didn't go so well. So I said, seriously, you're not going to cover it. He said, no, I'm sorry, but you don't have coverage. I said, this is the end of the conversation. I'll turn it over to legal. So I called my lawyer, who does insurance claims. And I said, call Ryan. Let him know that if they don't cover this, we're coming after them. And the agent. Later that evening, I get a message that said, I have good news for you. And I call him back in the morning and said, John, you have really good news for you. I said, what is it? I said, we found coverage. It, I worked for two hours and I found it and then he read me the language. I said, and so I told him, I said, this is really brilliant. I have an agent who sold me Tinker Toy Insurance and I have an adjuster who works for a company and they don't know the policy. I mean, it's literally true. But that's not why I was upset. I mean, it was a damage I could have paid for it. I mean, it wasn't, I mean, it was a big sum of money, but it, you know, it, it, we, we would have not lost our home if we had paid for it. You know what, what made me upset? Do you think that they would have found the coverage for a poor man? And I, by the way, I'm not a rich man, but I have some means. This has been a consistent thing I've seen from the time I rented cars at, as an engineer at Chrysler, and they played the same thing. Somebody rammed into me, and guess what? We only covered $20 a day for your replacement car, only 20 bucks. I said, seriously? I mean, I had the same response. Your client hits me. I have to go rent a car because mine is damaged, and you're not going to cover the full amount. I said, I don't think so. They found coverage. You see, this is not going to happen in the kingdom of God. Okay. We will get through this. I had, a, I had about six calls like that this week. So I, I managed to work it in here. But, 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 but you, see, you see what I'm saying? I could have paid for that claim. The fact that I had a, a competent lawyer and pushed back on it, they immediately found coverage. It, it's, it, it, for me, it is infuriating. Because... Uh, I, and, 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 um, and if you ever have that kind of thing, I will help you, okay? Call John Miller. I'll help you because it's wrong. Verse 4, but with righteousness he shall judge the, the, the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. Verse 6. This is almost incidental. You know, we, I love these next verses, you know, what the animals will be like. But that's just incidental to the real change. You know, think about what, how a world could work if you had individuals in power that would acclaim and embrace the ethics that are described earlier. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, and their young ones shall lie down together. The lion shall eat straw like an ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. I mean, it just... <laughs> You try that today. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's a different kingdom entirely from top to bottom. And we need to celebrate this you go to the feast, celebrate 
it's commanded. I mean, no, it's really hard, but, you know. Get whatever your heart desires, because you can afford it if you pay, if you pay for your second tithe. Isaiah chapter 35. We'll look at one more. There are many scriptures like this. Isaiah chapter 35, verse 5. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb shall sing, and the waters shall burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. I mean, when you, when you look at what Jesus did during his ministry, I think it's easy to understand why the disciples thought, this is it. This is it. And there have been incidents down through time. By the way, uh, Aaron Dean gave a sermon and a Q&A um, in Portsmouth, I'm going to say, it's probably been a month ago now. And he just kind of recounts some of, it's a, it's, here's how I would put it, it's a first person account of the recent history of the Church of God. And uh, it's worth a listen. It really is because I mean, he explains why, you know, I mean, when, when, when you're young and you listen back and you ask, well, why did people think um, certain ways and why did you think uh, things were eminent? Um, and he, he does a good job of explaining that you know, in a way that, that really makes sense. You know, if you, if, you, if you were with Jesus, and actually he gave them the power to heal. I mean, it says that. He sent them out, right, to, and gave them power to cast out demons, and you know, they were pretty excited about that, right? Um, th th that was a, the kingdom of God, the king was there, and certain aspects of it was happening. <clears throat> Third point. Where will it be established? Now, where is this going to be? Matthew chapter 5. And this is the State of the Union address, if you will, of Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 5, in verse 5. Blessed are the meek... For they shall inherit, here's that word again, it's the same word that we read back in Corinthians, they shall inherit the earth. It's going to be right here to start out, even though, as we read in Romans, there are cosmic implications. The kingdom of God is also prophesied to, of his kingdom, there will be no end, uh, Im implying expansion. Um, I, I saw something um, earlier this week that just came across my, my news feed and I didn't click on it, something I want to, it was about quantum physics. And um, this author, um, I just read the excerpt, and he said, in quantum physics, and the the... You know, we, we all learned in high school, if we went there, what, what, a, what an atom looks like. And you've got these balls, you know, orbiting around, it, around a core. If you actually look at an atom, um, which they can do now, it's not that, it's not that it, it just doesn't look like that. I mean, you've got electrons orbiting, but it's way uh, more um, complex than that. But this physicist was saying that in every atom, the entire universe is replicated in miniature form. And I thought, a little bit about, uh, the little bit I know about fractal geometry, I would not be surprised if that were the case. That the biggest thing there is, the universe, however big it is, um, and, and all the stuff that goes on there is replicated in miniature form in the smallest element being an atom. I mean, that's just the, the complexities of the creation that God gave us, and it's groaning right now. But the kingdom of God and what we will inherit is right here on this earth. Not, you know, Jesus comes back, right? We don't go there. We go to meet him and come back. 
other scriptures to um, note on that point is Revelation chapter 5.10. Oh, let's go to, to Psalm chapter 37. You know, Jesus didn't invent this. Not that he couldn't have, or well, maybe he did, um, because he's also the author of the Old Testament. But I, what I should say is this, is this is not a idea or a promise that's exclusive to the New Testament. Notice in verse 11 of Psalm chapter 37. But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. I mean, here's a, a prophecy in, in uh, Psalms that predates um, Jesus' statement on the Sermon on the Mount by a long, long time. So he was uh, basically paraphrasing that. Next point. How long will it endure, this kingdom, yet to come? Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. And the other one is, well, not, not go there, is Daniel chapter, well, maybe Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. But let's, look, let's go to Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. This is a scripture I'm speaking on trumpets, so I, you, you're going to hear it again, because I, I don't know how to give a sermon on trumpets without quoting this verse. Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, then the seventh angel sounded, and, they, then, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. I mean, this is, this is what John saw and was told to write down. But let's go to Daniel chapter 2, which, I mean, we've been in Daniel a lot. Um, Mr. Hall has given sermons um, about the 70 weeks prophecy. So we're familiar with the content of Daniel. The message to Daniel was almost exactly the same. You know, it says here, the kingdoms of the world have become the kingdoms. This is a statement of fulfillment of what is prophesied here. Verse 44, and in the days of, and in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and a kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. So here is a prophecy of what Revelation, although it's also prophecy, looks back and talks about it in, in looking backwards. But here's the same statement of, that answers the question, how long will it endure? It will consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. So once, once Jesus returns on the day of trumpets, I'm not sure if I should say that, um, and establishes the kingdom on this earth, it'll go on forever. It's not going to, it's not going to be as it's be left to other people, as all other all kingdoms have done. And the United States will be left to other people. Every kingdom, including ours, will be left to other people, and all for the same reason. The indigenous people that are now being touted as being such wonderful individuals. No, 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 no. These were cannibals. The, you know, it, they, they were eating each other, literally, okay? Um, that's why the land vomited them out. I mean, it, it's a cycle that is predictable and always is the same. The, the final point, and then um, the final point, and then I want to just talk for a moment about the feast. Um, why will this kingdom be established? This is maybe, maybe we've answered this question, but I did want to turn to Micah. Micah chapter 4. Micah chapter 4, the same, the, actually the same thing is also um, recorded in, in Isaiah chapter 2.
Micah chapter 4, verse 3 to 4. Here's the why. He shall judge between many peoples and rebuke strong nations. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. I mean, we're witnessing war in, in the Ukraine. Um, and, you know, the, the, the number of people who have died there are grossly underestimated. Um, and the corruption that is involved in, in that war machine is, is just astonishing. Um, it is not a moral war. There never has been one. This is why. Because we have never been able to wage peace. Never worked. But everyone shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall be, make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken it. The Feast of Tabernacles celebrates all of this and more. For eight days, we will search the scriptures and learn more about the kingdom yet to come and how we can be a part of it. I mean, that's the primary reason to go to the feast. Now, I know we have our, our great places to go, and that's fine. But this is the reason why. And this needs to be the predominant reason to go. Deuteronomy chapter 14. Verse 22, and you shall truly tithe all the increase of your grain that the fields produce year by year, and you shall eat before the Lord your God in the place where he chooses to make his name abide. The tithe of your grain and your new wine and your oil and the firstlings of your herds and your flocks, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. We invest, I intentionally use that word, we, God this is so important that God instructed them anciently, and I believe this is equally true today, that he wants us to invest 10% of our income to celebrate this feast because ultimately it teaches us to fear the Lord our God always. Talks about changing it to money, just in case somebody says, well, I'm, <laughs> I'm exempt of this. Right? I'm not a farmer. Um, there are other scriptures, but... Um, verse 25, Then you'll exchange it for money. Take the money in your hand and go to the place which the Lord your God chooses. I just say, while we still have money, <laughs> you know, let's, let's um, make good use of this. Verse 26, And you shall spend that money for whatever your heart desires, for oxen or sheep, for wine or similar drink, for whatever your heart desires, you shall eat there before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice, you and your household. I mean, this is an affirmative command to rejoice. We will have four times our normal expendable income during these eight days, between four and five times, depending on how you do the calculation. And God commands you to spend it on whatever your heart desires. And in this process, he says, we're going to learn to fear the Lord our God always. And I believe that it is a test where God can test to see what our heart desires. And depending on what your heart desires, he can make a determination 
and what you're able to handle. Most people can't handle money. And that's just, that's just a fact. <clears throat> it's true here that oxen, sheep, and alcoholic beverages are mentioned as part of a festival. I mean, you, you know, that's, that's all part of it. Let's go to Deuteronomy 16. Deuteronomy 16. <clears throat> Verse 13. You shall observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days when you have gathered from your threshing floor, from your wine press, and you shall rejoice in your feast, you and your son and your daughter, your manservant and your maidservant, and the Levite and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow who are within your gates. I mean, there's quite a list here. You and your household, your manservants and your maidservants. I mean, how do we, how do we practically live that out today? But I'd also challenge you, I mean, the, the Levite, you know, the ministry, the stranger, <laughs> That's a hard one, okay? We're to celebrate with the stranger who's within your gates? I mean, I've, I've uh, raised that I, uh, and said, okay, you know, how do I do that? How do we do that? That's a very good question. I mean, it, the, the implication here is that the festival is a is a celebration that's not an exclusive club. <clears throat> it's inclusive. To show people how it is done as a foretaste of the kingdom of God. Now, what does your heart desire? Okay. Is it just for me? You know, I'm going to go to the biggest place and splurge it all on me. If, if you want to do that, then that's perfectly within the, the purview of the commandment. It's just a, it is also a message that you are sending on what your heart desires. Okay? And, and I'm, not, I'm not speaking in judgment here at all. It's just, it, this is a choice that we make. And if that's what you want to do, then fine. Um, I would encourage you, however, that you, you budget some amount, having been the recipient of the unbelievable generosity of the people of God early on in the church. Um, you know, I was given, I, I, I just, you know, my, my first feast, I, 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 I couldn't fathom how people could be so generous as to give me enough money to take my family on a quote-unquote vacation, uh, which is what I uh, looked at it. I mean, I, it, it just, I had to be told <laughs> by Mr. Foster what I will do. He, he, he put it in those terms, and I said, oh, yes, I understand that. You will do this. You will take this money. <clears throat> I mean, this is a feast unlike anything else. I don't know of any other event, any other festival, any other summit, any, you know, where this amount of emphasis is on community and generosity. It's transformative. I wonder why that is. Go to Matthew chapter 25. Because these are the things we do. And then Matthew chapter 25 kind of sums it up. Verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all his holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. So this is a description 
of Jesus returning to sit on the throne of his glory, and we will sit on thrones of glory as well. And then here's the test. And all nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, as the shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then the king will come to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of this world. It's really difficult to mistake the context and the message here. It literally says, come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom. That's what we've been talking about the whole time. And then he enumerates what they did. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. Wow. You know, the, the feasts are a lot about food, both spiritual and physical. We're commanded to give food. Jesus, in his ministry, gave out food, and he, you know, he, he multiplied it. That was the first thing. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. Well, I guess at the Feast of Tabernacles, that could include alcoholic beverages. Actually, when, when you go back in time, uh, for most of human history, um, a beer and wine were um, primary beverages because the water particularly in populated areas, was so bad it was not um, um, uh, safe to drink. You know, this, this gets down. The, the interesting thing about this list is these are not high and mighty deeds. These are deeds that everybody can do. There's no one sitting in this room that does not have the capacity to give food and water to someone in need. We have a plenty compared to other parts of the world. <clears throat> I was a stranger and you took me in. Now that's a tough one. How many of us would be willing to take a stranger in? Doesn't say your, you know, your friends, your community, and and you know, I, uh, don't don't misunder <laughs> misunderstand what I'm saying. There are strangers you should not take in. Okay, are we clear on that? Especially women. Okay, <laughs> there are strangers you should not take in. So, but the stranger that was named in Deuteronomy 16 is the stranger who is within your gate, which is someone in your community that you know that is just a tad different from us. Okay, we got a bunch of them down in our way, in our area. I mean, we're, we're as different as we are the same. and that, that, that we, we could be a, a, a long story on that. These are tests of heart. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Now, we, we may not be that far away from a time when we have more opportunity to visit people we know in prison. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you? And he has the whole list. And the king answered and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did this to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. And if you check Jesus' life on who he considered his quote-unquote brother, it was a pretty big scope of people. I would just suggest this to you. 
that if, if we celebrate the feasts, and as we celebrate the feasts, you think about it. The activities that we've done, and I remember um, Vic Kubik mentioning some years ago about a, um, a mayor that, was it a mayor down in Florida, I think, that, that spoke at the feast and came in and welcomed people. And I remember we used to have the mayor of the um, town in Germany do that, uh, welcome the people. And he, he made some comment about you know, our people and how accommodating we are um, and easy to deal with. Um, but as we keep the feasts, we do it in accordance with Scripture. Let me check off pretty much everything on this list. Just wanted to give you a foretaste of what we can do and who we can be at the Feast of Tabernacles this year. Because it truly is a small foretaste of the kingdom yet to come.